Hello and welcome to the Judo Way of Life podcast. Today I'm joined by Romina Titanti. How are you, Romina? Hi, David. I'm good. Hopefully I pronounced your name right there. We, uh, we had a little trial run before, the, uh, before we started recording. <laughs> yes, that's correct. How's your day going so far? Yeah, good, good. Excited to have a little chat about judo and more. Yeah, good, good. So usually start the podcast off by, you know, giving you a chance to explain, uh, you know, how you got started in judo, a little bit about your journey and, you know, where you came from. Yeah, yeah, of course. So yeah, my name's Romina. Uh, I mean, I've been into martial arts or grappling since as long as I can remember. So I did start judo when I was eight years old um, and traveled, um, you know, due to my father's uh journey with um at being an expat and so i did i was fortunate enough to do judo around the world which is um really blessed now that i look back and just recently i received my uh, judo black belt and i'm a jiu-jitsu brown belt as well i train uh, judo with uh, judo matsu under Aaron Janviv, and i train jiu-jitsu at the school that i manage as well which is called gracie baja st peter's and I teach uh, the programs there, kids and women's program. I teach a few fundamentals classes and a takedown class, of course, being influenced by judo as well. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, I, I've grown up, um, I'm from Argentina, but I've been yeah blessed that I had a childhood that was very nomad in, in that sense. So I, every two to three years, I'd be moving to a different country. So picked up a few languages but also it was it was great to be able to feel how judo is really that international sport and um, no matter where I went yeah there was some similarities and some differences that you can pick up and yeah see I was really keen to see what uh, how judo kind of continues throughout my life as well and what was learning judo initially in Argentina like because I know there's a couple of high level Argentinian players or there have been over the years is is judo big in Argentina yeah so funnily enough in especially because I have you know jiu-jitsu to compare it to judo is much bigger um than jiu-jitsu and it's strange because for example jiu-jitsu is really big in Brazil and it's you know next door but I think judo since yeah since I can remember I mean jiu-jitsu is quite a, a new sport and I think judo has always uh, been on been on the cards and um, Paula Pareto was like always a big idol of mine growing up as well and I was fortunate enough as well to to train uh, I was like a few years back I think it was four or five years ago as well so yeah it was it was amazing just to see you know judo judo is nice in that it, it's a sport but it's also a way of being able to connect with people and make friends and for me that was like a huge thing especially moving in different countries you know school is great you can make friends but there's just something about I don't know I guess it's the contact aspects to judo and grappling that you make friends really easily Um, and so I've always been really fortunate about just the sport connecting me with with kids in that culture Uh, I didn't in many cases I didn't really know how to speak the language, right? So in one of the places I trained judo was um, Czech Republic and it was an English school, but a lot of the kids would speak Czech and I was a bit, felt a bit left out (laughs) until, um, you know, there's that universal language, I guess you can call it, about just grappling. (laughs) So yeah, um, I've always been a big fan, a big fan of that as well. So other than the Czech Republic, where else have you trained? Oh, where did you growing up? So Czech Republic was one of them. I did judo as well in uh, Rome, Italy. So I did speak the language there. Um, I did New York and then Australia. And where's been your favorite so far? Oh, that's a hard question. I think in terms of like friendships and memories, I think Rome was really where I developed. I think, yeah, kids that... I was just so excited to, after school, I wasn't really keen to go hang out with some of my friends at school. It was more about my, my judo friends. So I wanted, you know, school to be over so that I could um, meet up with them. And so in terms of childhood, I think that's probably one place, but I, there's something about 
practicing judo here in Australia, I think as an adult that came full circle for me. So I think I did have a period where I quit judo. And I think that's also, you know, something that I, for a long time, was like, oh, I wish I'd never quit. And, you know, people often don't come back on the mats because of, for that reason, you know, they say, oh, no, you know, I'm too either other insecurities, whether it's um, I'm too old or I'm not, I, I don't do that anymore for whatever reason. I really enjoyed coming coming back on the judo mats. And I think jujitsu played a little bit of a role there because I started jujitsu as well as an adult. And then I had some essentially unfinished business with judo. So <laughs> I came back and I'm, yeah, I'm really glad that I did because it, it did for me in many sense, uh, in a way, just came full circle with me and I felt that in my recent um showdown grading as well why why did you quit yeah so when I was probably around those teenage years I often saw kids that would that had started judo with me or that we had built this nice relationship on the mats and suddenly they started quitting so I you know nowadays I coach kids and I think it's really important to have those those friendships with each other because I think one one reason that keeps them on the mats or keep, kept me on the mats for sure was being able to have that connection with or that time of day where I would be oh well, let's you know let's go um, meet up with my my best friend and then it became as well a little bit about the competition aspect. So I've always done sports and I've always saw competing or I was raised in a household where competing was just part of it. And I think kids and adults really place a big emphasis, I guess, on the result of competition and probably maybe what we nowadays we can pinpoint as their self-worth. And so a lot of the times it was... Uh, my parents were like, oh, you should compete, you should compete. And I would, and I would win and I would, you know, get all of this like attention and, you know, praise. And then when I didn't want to, or when it didn't go my way, I think that's when, and it just became more often, right? It was more often, more often, more often that that would happen. And I thought, ah, oh, I don't, I don't like this anymore. It's not really fun. It's not why I started. So I, I do have those conversations with with parents and even with myself or even with uh, adults to kind of make that distinction because I very much am guilty or, or have made that mistake um, as as we all do where we're so fixated I guess on on a result that we yeah we confuse the two that's a bit of a blurred line um, result with with oh I'm you know I'm not good enough or and you start to say things like that, and when really it should be about just sticking sticking to the mats because it brings you so much more benefits than just a gold medal or whatever it might be. Yeah, it is something as an athlete, and then coming as a coach, that I've concept that I've sort of grappled with over the years, and where you know where I've come to, and this, you know this is conversations with other people interested in your your thoughts on this might be is because judo is not just judo you know they're just fighting sports i think just tap into such a I don't know, animalistic part of our brain that other sports don't especially maybe like team sports that you, it just amplifies that win or lose because it really does tap into that fight or flight mechanism where maybe playing tennis or running sprinting or something that just doesn't quite tap into the same not to say you don't get nervous but it it just you know because it is a fight, even though there are rules and it's controlled, it's still it's still tapping into that mechanism, and why that makes it feel far more. Re- I don't know if "real" is the right word, but you know more. It it just affects you on a on a deeper level, perhaps. And then that win lose is is a more amplified versus win lose say in a team sport. Well, yeah, I mean, that's right. It's just kind of, it's only you out there and whether you win or lose, um, it feels like, you know, it's o- only you. And it's just uh, making that distinction for me. Um, and I think that's why I enjoy coaching kids so much. In a way, it was 
uh, it might be my my way of you know talking nowadays we know things like uh, you know child and things like that for me I think it's sometimes when I hear some of the things that they say when competing or when they can't quite get let's say a, a technique or they can't beat this one kid at at the gym it's it's so like you said natural to feel like you're not good enough and the first reaction is you quit and so in order to I think avoid that or have less of that that's why I think that there's that natural tendency as as a coach where I feel a little bit more connected with um, the kids program than some of the adults program because I've been in their shoes and I've, I realized that it's so natural, easy to have that frame of mind of saying, if I can't do this now, then when, especially with kids, when uh, the concept of time or knowledge being something exponential, like they can grow, for example. So they'll say things like, I can't, I can't do this technique Um and this is why he, you know, always is able to throw me or is always able to submit me and I want to quit. So that's that, that line of thinking. And what's really helped me, but also some of the kids, is adding the word like yet, for example. So, you know, I, uh, I'm not able to do this technique and then I'll go yet. For them, there's something about that word that, I can see it in their face and like, oh, oh, okay. So if I put in the the work or the time or the this or the X factor, then I might be able to, then I have that chance. So for me, I was, you know, going back to your original question, you know, why, why did you quit? I think there was one component where it stopped being fun, but then also I couldn't see that the goal wasn't really to you know, win all of these accolades, it was more about kind of staying on the mats and seeing how judo could, you know, change your life in many ways, you know, change your your resilience, change the, the mindset. And I think if you had told me when I was a teenager that I'd be, you know, combining all of these different things in my life, like my business degree with my passion of martial arts, I don't know that I would have painted it that way I think it just kind of happened and it's it's beautiful I think life has a funny way of showing you how to if you just stick through it so the whole thing about um you know judo being a life lifelong journey um but that's only if you if you let it be that if that makes sense yeah well I mean th- this is something I, I've not really talked with that many people about and, and it's something I sort of struggled with alone and I didn't share it and I probably should have done but I was very much on the verge of quitting a number of times you're completely quitting judo like sort of like late late teens very close to throwing the towel in and then you know at other times and I think like I've said like right that's it no more competitions and I've, I've said that a few times and then come back and you know always ended up coming back and then now, it, you know, they've gone full into court. But yeah, a lot of the time, uh, and I think a lot of people, it's only natural, I think, that you're going to end up going through that at certain times. You know, and again, for a number of the reasons that you've mentioned there, you know, and it's similar but different, you know, in terms of where I was at. But I think everyone will go through that in any sport or any job or any any situation. I think it's only sort of healthy that you go through that sort of process of questioning. And, you know, some people come back like you have, and you know some people don't, and and that's fair enough. But yeah, I think like you say, how you how it's managed with kids as they're developing. I think uh, with coaching more kids as well, like, like as yourself, how you sort of set that framework is so important because they've got no, you know, say you've got an eight year old kid, like they've got no concept of time and learning, and you know the future is just this is so weird to them because they've only been around for eight years. There's no way of processing how to deal with, you know, the competition stuff or not being able to learn something, right? It's just very sort of absolute. It all, it almost feels as well that, um, you know, everyone everyone will go through this these thoughts like we're saying about quitting. And it, it is a bit of 
finding um, a balance, right? So, you know, you, you're not really that into it. You're just trying to get into martial arts or whatever it might be. And then I have this tendency, for example, to go full throttle on something. And so I go to the other extreme of like, and I think that's where um, the competition bug kind of started. I went all the way to the other side. And now it's somewhere around the middle where you're trying to find how martial arts or judo can play a, a role in between. It doesn't have to be the everything. It doesn't have to be something you do like kind of, but it's something that you do regularly and, you know, you see the benefits um, and really you can see uh, competition as more of a, a tool for self-development as opposed to a way of life, right, or a lifestyle, which you know, don't get me wrong, if you're uh, an elite level athlete, it takes every single ounce of you. And I think that that is the way. But if it means, you know, you going from one extreme to not doing it at all, I think the the answer, you know, might lie somewhere in the middle of, of seeing, you know, how can this, this way of life, this art still be of benefit to you in, in the n- numerous ways that it does because of it because it is a fighting sport and I think that's where I kind of found found peace with it and was able to come back on the mats as well and well, I know you mentioned it already about your recent grading you know if you've come back to the sport and was that sort of something that brought you back in wanting to get your black belt was that a sort of a carrot maybe that sort of led you along to come back and start training again? So the way the way I kind of was attracted to coming back was I had started jujitsu, um, yeah, like as a young adult and I, I was you know, they obviously saw the the relationship between judo and, and jujitsu and seeing how much it benefits to already have done the martial arts so I started judo first and then came into jiu-jitsu and they were like mm, have you done this before um and so I said no not not really jiu-jitsu but I've done judo and um and it's a, definitely a strong base and but I was and it's very it's very common in judo I'm the jiu-jitsu girl and in jiu-jitsu I'm the judo girl so I just felt that even though I had that kind of label on the jiu-jitsu mats there was definitely some freshening up to do with with my judo knowledge and just uh, how I move around. And so that's when I started to look into the different judo gyms around the area. And I was fortunate enough to uh, really connect with Oren, who his gym is actually like a five minute walk from the gym that I manage. So it worked out really well, but he, he really helped me fall in love with judo again and understood that I was trying to make judo work with essentially jujitsu game and jujitsu goals at the time and then as I as I got more involved in uh, jujitsu competitions and and you know really trying to develop there I fell back in love with judo in a way and I started having my own judo dreams and that that was one of them was to uh, get my show done and that was just earlier this year not not too long ago actually a few months ago and it did feel like a bit of a full full circle for me where a lot of the similar feelings that I had as as a kid where I was you would tell me oh I can't do this throw no I can't like I can't this isn't a, a throw for me or whatever um but now as an as an adult, you can kind of talk to yourself as well and say, oh, I think this is just, you know, your your own kind of insecurities or things like that 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 are um nibbling away, if you will. And and yeah, Orange Orange also has a, a kids program there. And um I can see, like I said, it, it's always beautiful to to watch because I see myself in a lot of them. So yeah, it came full circle for me. And I think, like I said, life has a funny way of of showing our, our story, our own judo story. Your story doesn't have to be the same as, as everyone else's. Can you just talk us through the process for getting your show down? Because 
I don't know if you've ever seen any of this chatter on the internet, but there's like on the Reddit, Judo Reddit theme, I've seen a number of people make comments about how difficult the Australian grading system looks. And you know, obviously you've just gone through it. So I mean, love, love for you to share your experience of, you know, what you had to do and the process that went into getting your Dan grade. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm actually quite proud and also just really amazed at how the process really turns it around for you because I think at the beginning how most from what I've spoken to people about is you you feel like you're not ready and you feel like oh I don't really know if I'm ready for you know to wear that belt around my waist but as you go through the process because of those so many steps and because you know people they might see it as challenging or so hard I actually find that because you go through that by the end of it, you, you feel like a black belt, you know, you, you feel like you've earned it. And I think that's really important to, um, to feel right. Especially as you're teaching, um, I think a little bit of that confidence has to, has to shine. So the process that I enjoyed as well, part of the process was the fact that you, quite literally, if you choose to do it through competition. So there's three main avenues, one being you you earn the points that you need. So in my case, it was 100 points. Some cases, it's 150 um, through competition, some through knowledge, and then through service. So I chose mine through competition. And it really felt like quite literally, you are fighting for your black belt, right? So, and I, I think that's beautiful in and of itself it doesn't mean that it you know it doesn't matter how long it takes you whether that's two years five years whatever that might be that's your own journey so it emphasizes that that aspect Um, you don't have to go around beating and then you know you you walk around I'm a black belt I think it's it's really nice the fact that you doesn't matter how long it takes you that's that's your own journey then in terms of part of the grading on the day you have to perform what is um, a kata and I quite enjoyed that part as well I was dreading dreading that aspect but I hadn't necessarily been too involved in the kata portion of judo and then obviously the grading introduced that to to me and it was you start to realize why everything it has its purpose I think if you ask someone fresh that started judo to do the kata a lot of the skills needed to perform it whether it's timing strength balance they wouldn't be able to and that's why they're first starting judo they might be lower belts and then that's why someone doing the grading and demonstrating that is a black belt so i think that's that's one of the reasons um i felt the kata was it surprised me at the end because I was like, oh, that's why we do it. <laughs> or at least that's my interpretation of it. And then obviously studying the Gokyu, you know, I think that that whole process, you, you, you feel like, okay, I know all the moves or, you know, I'm, I'm close to. Um, and again, that process of studying it, you might not know at the beginning, but towards the end, especially doing Judo New South Wales provides three or four workshops leading up so you know they really assist you in in you doing well in the grading on the day so again when you put all that together at the beginning it sounds like wow that's that's a lot to go through but I think my main uh, learning out of it was that that whole process is there for a reason and yep it might take you you know a year to kind of feel like you're ready for it or you you but nonetheless those however I would say it takes about six months to to really do all of that once you decide you want to do a grading at whatever time of the year I think that that was um, my main main learning that just because you're scared at the beginning go through it stick through it which sounds a lot like judo in, in and of itself and you know you'll get there and you'll you'll really feel like you deserve it and then in terms of the, the actual grading day, and obviously you mentioned you did the, the Carter, the Nagano Carter. Was there any other theory component you had to do? And what did that look like, if, if so? Yeah, so the theory was, um, so that, yeah, there's those two parts. So once the Carter was done, then within the grading, there's two groups were divided and you 
kind of asked to show um, certain techniques both in in both uh, Newaza and Tachiwaza and you go through the Gokyo essentially. But the, again, the nice thing about the providing the the grading, the workshops is that already the graders can kind of tell what you know and what you don't know. And as long as you're closing the gap each week, there's no reason to test everything and having this big weight on your shoulders on the day, right? So on the day, it's really about demonstrating your judo. And yes, of course, they're going to test you on on certain techniques, making sure that you know that you know the names and how to and how to teach them. There's a big teaching aspect as well that you're graded on, which I think is really important. I'll come back to that. But because because you're going through the workshops and as long as you can kind of demonstrate that you're closing in on that that knowledge gap on the day you should really the biggest feedback was or the biggest thing that they wanted to see is really shine your judo and I think that's that's uh yeah that's that's amazing so in terms of the grading as well there was a big a big teaching component so keeping it simple right and not over over explaining techniques or making it really simple imagining almost like every time there's an audience of kids and they can only remember two or three things for me that's that was really nice to see that there was an emphasis on the teaching aspect because we take it for granted in judo that you know this is the process this is how it is but really what's happening is you're developing or Judo New South Wales is developing a standard, right? So a standard in teaching, a standard in knowledge. Um, if you choose the competition route, a standard in your instructors having that competition experience. Whereas I think in many martial arts, that isn't necessarily the case. So I think it's something that Judo New South Wales should be proud of. And even people thinking about doing their grading should should be really proud of because you know, I'm, I'm experiencing uh, women, uh, men, like all different sizes and ages and making them look and more accessible to people, then I think that's another way of growing. And I think in that sense, um, yeah, they're doing an amazing job of doing that. Yeah, I really like that point about the whole teaching thing. It's just it's something I, I joke about because I got to sort of third Dan as a competition player and you know, the theory side of things wasn't overly emphasized uh, in, in Great Britain where I, where I graded to third down. There was a lot more competition focus, and that's a good thing. But in terms of actually understanding judo as a bigger picture, my knowledge, sort of third to fourth down, and now as a fourth down, has been coaching a lot more. As, as It's probably grown more than it did from sort of nine years old until, I don't know, sort of mid-20s when I got my third down, right? And it's only just, it's because I've been coaching. I'm coaching to a, a wide group from kids to adults and different types of adults in the sense of weight groups and things, you know, with different needs and wants from the sport. But, you know, my knowledge is a, is a, of, of judo as a whole has grown as a teacher way more than ever as a competitive athlete. Also going back, I like your point that you made about the, the Carter. So I think, and I, I definitely fall into this, is sometimes quite a bit of you love it or hate it. And if you hate it, you really hate it. And if you love it, you really love it. And there's like a very small amount of sort of gray area in between from my experience. You know, there's not, and it's, it's something, you know, what you said sort of resonated with me as well. It was something I've started to understand more the importance of in, in the, the whole picture of judo. And you know how it does sort of fit in as it, it has its place. I mean, I wouldn't say I love it, but but it's just I I need, I, I want to understand the reason why we do it. There's always it always seems to come back to well, there's a reason for it, and if you can kind of pinpoint the reason, even if it just makes sense for yourself, then you kind of do it with more enjoyment, right? If other than because otherwise the grading is just going to be it's a, this big black cloud, you know, you're like, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this. Have to. But if you find the reason of why you're doing it, then I think, or why it's there, then it's a little bit easier to get through it, really. 
Yeah, then you build people build that resistance, mm. and then when you start to build a resistance, you you start to you fight against it. You go, oh, not this again, or oh, Carter's rubbish, or or, or fit, whatever it is, or even some people will be like, oh, competitions. I don't want to do competitions to get the points and things, you know. So whatever area you build that resistance to, and I, I was that. I built resistance towards Carter. I just, you know, it was a part of the sport. I just didn't want to really, I don't know, just give any thought to. You know, competition was the the main thing for me, and but like understanding how, like you say, the the theory and the Carter fit into the bigger picture. And it's like you said, I don't love Carter, <laughs> but I definitely have a more of an appreciation for its importance since so grading in Australia because I, I did my fourth down here and I had to do the the, the Kimi no Carter and demonstrate that and have, know it like Azuki and Tori, and that gave me a, a new appreciation for it yeah so did they did they do the kata in great britain or do they yeah but i mean off the top of my head if um it might have changed it's been a long time since the great in the uk but i'm pretty sure it was for your first down you pretty much only need to do the first line of the nagana kata for your second down it was the first and second line or something like that i mean i might i might be wrong it might have changed but yeah I, it wasn't the biggest deal yeah biggest emphasis and we I, they do do this in New South Wales, but due to the lack of numbers, it's quite difficult uh, in Great Britain all the way through. We you know we went to a, a grading competition, so the competition was just specifically for grading, and you went there and you fought with other people, right? And then the theory was just done as a side side thing, and then all the way up to sort of your your first down, your your coach would sign you off and be like, "Oh, his theory is." equivalent to say a blue belt right and you'd go to the competition and depending on your uh, so you would go to the grading and depending on how you fought on the day how many wins you had you know whether you won by Ippon or Wazari then they would decide whether you were a blue belt or if you were still you know if you were going from like orange to green for example just as a yeah sort of small example uh and then up to your your, your dang grade, you would do a, a lineup. So you, you had to you fight for your lineup. So you have to win, I had to win two fights. Right. So yeah, big, big emphasis on, I guess, the competition side, even on grading day. Oh, it was weird when I did it because I was, you know, I went from a ju- uh, like a, a junior kid's grade to an adult's grade. So I had to fight for my first cue on the day. So I won two fights and then had to win two more fights to qualify for a lineup. And then did my three fights one after another as a lineup, and you had to win them all by Ippon. And they do do a bats again here. They do do the lineup if there's enough numbers to do it. But I, don't, I can't remember the last time they ran one in New South Wales. And like you said, you you did um, you got your competition points as a, an accumulation. Yeah. So you know multiple competitions, not just on the day. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Awesome. I'd like to talk to you about the whole judo versus jujitsu thing. So obviously you do both and. You know, there's there's definitely a a certain I don't know narrative really that it's two elements fighting against each other, right? Mm. What's what's your opinion? So so I think um, from what I've, I've thought about this a while, and I I realized that because of the the rule set of either sport, you start to develop skills right so there's a big emphasis on in judo for example you can win by pinning someone so you develop certain skills especially at a young age of being able to do that whereas for example in jiu-jitsu if you hold it's actually considered in in certain positions it's considered like ugly jiu-jitsu right so and and that's where i think if we um, were to merge some of these things like or even practice the both, you get benefits from the both. So in judo, for example, um, at a when you're a kid, even if you start on your knees and that that act of like, you know, having those what we now call as like isometric holds, that skill is something that I find is a little bit lacking, you know, in, in jiu-jitsu because it's okay to be it's not the end of the world or not the end of the fight. When your back is on the ground, you can still fight from there. But you still shouldn't have the reaction of allowing someone to throw you or put your back on the ground. And so what I've seen 
translates quite well um, from having a base in judo first and then jujitsu is that you have that skill right you have that skill and then you can choose to use it or not use it or you know use it in your favor or whenever is timely for you and then in jujitsu yep i mean because of the time spent on the ground there's certain things that are a little bit more just more developed or there's just a a, a vast array of of things that you can do and it's not just in certain positions right so in judo big emphasis on the turtle position um but in jiu-jitsu because the the fighting evolves not only in in that position but uh, a lot in more intricate as well positions then there's that knowledge there so what what i find I, that has happened with being able to practice the both. I have this like style of fighting that needs to work for the both <laughs> because if I if I all of a sudden start, let's say in jiu-jitsu uh, playing uh, a guard game that is very jiu-jitsu, so for example, lapels, and then it's not that I'm not interested in that. It's just that that kind of stuff I won't be able to use in judo, for example. So I tend to have developed this style that I can use in both and that I won't be penalized for either. So if I all of a sudden start grabbing legs and get used to grabbing legs all the time in jiu-jitsu, I, it'll be very hard to undo all of these reactions because the body doesn't think in, it thinks in instincts it'll be really hard when it comes to judo competitions, right? So so for me, I think it was, I, I it's a very diplomatic answer, but basically I really like making them work for me, both of them, and they both have something to bring up to the table. And you could really argue that with, if you bring in wrestling to the table as well. I've learned a lot with, we've had wrestling classes at, at our gym, Uh, most recently at St. Peter's and there's a lot of crossovers between judo and wrestling as well and the the only difference is you can you can grab legs and and there's certain again rules to the game that they develop and the skills that they develop and but it's not to say that you can't use those skills in judo or jiu-jitsu so I think that was my long-winded answer (laughs) Yeah, no, I think, and I, again, like uh, we, we've had this conversation, so you know, it's obviously putting you on the spot for the uh, for the podcast a little bit, but like, you know, I I, I share a similar similar opinion. I think I, I don't understand why there's such a not rivalry, but you know, like there's the again like these two extreme camps really, and I don't find there's that in that many people down the middle, and uh, you know, it sounds like you're down the middle. Obviously, you're taking from each discipline what you need for what you want. And I think that's you know that's what I've I've said when I've been asked about this. I think on podcasts and and does in general. You know I think they're just two amazing sports, and you know it depends what you want. You know if you if your focus is more judo, and you want to improve you, you your groundwork, you can obviously do that at judo. And I know like some clubs are a good mixture of both standing and ground. You know some clubs concentrate more on standing, and you might be missing that ground game, and you know training a bit of bjj might or you know will help you improve that and you like you say you take what you want to help with the other and then vice versa you know i've been doing bjj you want to get better at takedowns and throwing and just develop that awareness on your feet the balance the coordination that you might not necessarily get if you go to a club that a bjj club that always starts from the knees or from pulling guard and you're maybe missing out on that element and you just want to get a bit better at it just to help your jiu-jitsu, you know? So I know you say wrestling. I, I've cross-trained with ballet. I did ballet for a while to help my judo. Did you? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Again, it, it seems, you know, you, 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 I was never going to be a ballet dancer. <laughs> I look terrible in a pair of tights. <laughs> That's not true. Actually, I look great. But, you know, like I, I needed to get better at pointing my toes for... Also to Gary, Haragoshi, Uchimata, and develop that sort of leg strength and that ability, you know. So and my coach sort of jokingly, sort of seriously said, Oh, you need to you need to get yourself to ballet, you learn how to do that. So I was like, Yeah, no worries. And I did. I think like you say, you know, yeah, I, I don't quite understand why people get so bent out of shape over the whole 
judo versus jujitsu thing? I think it's more like, you know, when they start to, when they start to ask a question, like very clear cut, which is better. And that's when, that's when I say, you know, this long winded, winded answer. Cause I think most people, when, when they hear all of this, wouldn't have a problem with it, with, with the points that we're making. It's just that when, you know, when they just want the one answer and say, you know, which one's better, well, better is very broad, right? What do you, what do you mean by better, better for self-defense, better for your body, which one's harder, which one's more, gives you more longevity. So better doesn't really, I think, answer the, will, will, will really depend on what, what you're asking, right? Uh, what you're really trying to ask. And I think that's why for me, I just see the benefits in, in both. And, and that's why I think, you know, you and I have, have done cross training because we just want to be able to do whatever art we pick better. That's, that's really what it is. So, you know, I, I always have these, these little arguments with people. <laughs> yeah. Well, so like you say, context is very important. It's like, well, you know, what, what you're measuring it against, which is better. Well, like I'm biased. I think I think judo's better for me personally because that's what I've done for 25 years and that's what I enjoy. But that doesn't mean I don't think jujitsu is an amazing sport and has it. You know, I, I think it's great. I don't think you know it, it really does depend on like what angle you're coming from. Yeah, exactly. And so you said you're a brown belt in BJJ. You know how how does how do you find the grading system between judo and jujitsu? Does it differ much in terms of my process and? Yeah. So. I think, you know, judo, judo being an Olympic sport is a little bit more developed and it's been around for longer. So in, in that sense, it's, you know, we talk about judo Australia and it seems to be around across the world in judo, there is a, a set standard and yes, judo Australia might be a little bit more difficult or a little, I put a little bit more um, emphasis on certain, certain things, but more or less around the world, there is that process of grading from you know lower belts to a showdown so jiu-jitsu isn't quite as defined yet i think one it's a younger sport but two as well it doesn't have an overarching organization where i think everyone can come together and really nut down what it would look like for people to to grade to black belt it's often your instructor that's been grading you or maybe it could be a new one as well it's whether they believe, you know, you are ready. And, and that conversation is very individual. You know, what, what does it look like in terms for you to be a black belt? It might be pushing in competitions. Yep, that's, that's one avenue. Two, it might be the teaching aspect. Um, or, you know, I want to see you get more involved in X or develop X more. So there, it's a little bit more informal in that sense. So I think that's why I was really, um, I really enjoyed actually the grading in judo because I think it's a little bit very clear cut for me. It was, and especially just because of the way I'm hardwired, okay, I need to do this, 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 and this, and then, you know, enjoy the journey whilst, whilst you're doing it. Um, but in jujitsu, yeah, we don't, we don't really have that. And I've, I've often spoken to yeah people in leadership positions at least here in australia how you know we can learn from that really and obviously i'm assuming getting your black belt in bjj is one of your goals yeah yeah <laughs> yeah hopefully how far along do you, are you on your journey towards that so at the moment i'm a three stripe brown belt so in jiu-jitsu we have stripes um it's generally four on each belt um kids is a little different so there's one more stripe and then uh, similar with the affiliation that I'm part of, which is Gracie Baha, there's two gradings a year. So quite similar actually to, to uh, Judo New South Wales. So, yeah, I mean, we've had conversations, so we'll see. I think within the next year, probably it's looking, looking like something that could happen. Yeah. Awesome. There's not many, not many double Jiu-Jitsu and Judo black belts. So that's yeah, that would be yeah, be a be weird. I'd wear them both <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I think I'd, I'd do the same. Like it's something I want to one day try and get around to when I got a bit more time. I keep, I keep trying to squeeze the jujitsu in um, to you know develop that side of things. And because I approach, I've approached jujitsu very much from a, as a judo player. Yes. And you know, like yeah, there's there's massive holes in my knowledge as as a someone practicing jujitsu, and you know, there are holes I'd like to fill just because I, I, you know, the more knowledge, you know, the more knowledge you have, the the better. Yeah, you're going to be as oh, for my opinion anyway. The more knowledge you have, it just, the better you're going to be as a teacher, as a as an athlete. As just yeah, you know, for me that's something I I like to attain. Just to be more well rounded. Yeah, well they say they say that once you get to the purple belt, you're halfway there, and you know most people that can get to that level, then that black belt's more achievable. It's that blue belt stage because it's the longest um, in jiu-jitsu, at least, that that's when people really start to drop off. They call it the blue belt blues. So you got past that, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's less there's less belts in PJJ than judo. Let me have a little think quick. So there's, there's white to blue, blue to purple. So there's five belts, right, in jiu-jitsu? Yeah, so more or less it's the same, but I think the the time on the blue is generally longer. So that's why they call it the blue belt blues, and it's yeah, because we've got a couple of interim belts. You know, we got seven in judo. Then I go white, yellow, orange, green, blue, brown, black. Yeah, seven. So you you yeah. So I usually call it between orange and green. You get a lot of people dropping yeah. off, and then I, I think I blue to brown. You get a lot of people dropping off as well. Mm. from what i've experienced which would be those sort of interim ones so you get sort of orange belt and you start to be like oh no i, I know these techniques i know what i'm doing now but the, the actual application is still the the elusive part and i think you know people get frustrated because they start to be like oh well they have a, more of an understanding of the throws uh or to, oh, like oh, well you know and then they start doing the competitions and then they go oh, hang on <laughs> this happening this application part's a bit tricky <laughs> and they become um you know like well like you said um, in terms of we, we spoke about it before about kids you know, all, all, adults very much very, very very similar in i think in this um, aspect is the fact yeah they, they drop out because they're just they're like, i can't do this yeah and i think like we said earlier about how you set the framework for kids obviously then leads into adulthood and if you know, if, if as a kid growing up, you haven't, other than school, haven't maybe gone through the process of learning a skill, then as an adult, you know, you don't maybe necessarily understand the process and pushing through the plateau and, you know, making sure you, you, you know, just that regular training, you know, you, you're looking for that constant reward maybe or the feeling of continually making progress. And if you have a session or a competition or like a, a run of a couple of weeks or months where you don't feel like you're making any progress, you are, well, nah, screw this, I'm finishing. I think that happens quite a bit. Like you, obviously a blue belt for BJJ, as you said, and I reckon, yeah, orange to green, sort of that period in judo. Mm. I want to move to finish off talking about, um, you've, you've said that you've done a lot of coaching with kids and you enjoy it and you you, you have mentioned certain things, but about why um just really like to know like sort of uh, your, your philosophy to coaching kids um there's something i coach a lot of kids uh with the judo and stuff there's something i'm very interested in how how do you how do you approach it coaching kids yeah so i think uh whether it's judo or jiu-jitsu or any other sport really i see it like a little bit like a like a pyramid so at the very top is the the art like of judo or jiu-jitsu. And I think that's what we concentrate a lot on and is what is most notable. What you see, it's like the tip of the, the an iceberg, you know, iceberg being underwater mostly. And the, the tip of it is like, oh, they can't do a throw, an arm bar or whatever, or they get they get submitted. And so, you know, I'll often have parents or even kids themselves say, oh, can I get help with this? And yep, there's there's merit to that. But then I think there's just underlying building blocks that are things like how they, let's say, eat, for example. So 
oftentimes I'll see, uh, you know, kids have certain snacks, which then off, uh, oftentimes they'll, it'll impact how their energy levels. So they'll have like a big sugar crash. So that's on one side, one building block, I think is their nutrition. Then it'll be things like if they're not able to do, let's say, a cartwheel, how in jiu-jitsu we've got something called a cartwheel pass. So just as an example, right, it's going to be hard if they can't move their own body to be able to move someone else's, right? So that's their, like, what I call, I guess, like their physical awareness. And then at the very bottom, which is basically the base of the pyramid, is what I see as like the mental portion, right? The mental, how they think, how their mind works. So there's this natural thing that happens that if I'm getting submitted all the time, if I'm getting tapped or if I get thrown, yeah, like I'm doing poorly and, um, or even they go into the, they go into the, fight or sparring session and they are already their confidence level is super low because of a previous maybe encounter or um, fight with that same kid then there's no way they're going to be able to come on top and apply like this you know beautiful technique that maybe we should that day or the week prior so sometimes when I go into a private or when I'm looking at a kid in particular and why he's struggling, I try and see, is it really the technique that he's not being able to apply or, or the reason why he's always on the bottom and just getting smashed? Or is it the confidence maybe, or is it the fact that he's not all there because his or her, the way that he's nourishing the body is then coming downhill because of this massive sugar rush that has just hit, hit them or really they can't move that body that well like they're afraid of even doing a forward roll well yeah there's that fear element and it goes back again to to the first building block where there's the confidence is lacking so many times when I look at a private we might concentrate on something some of those aspects first to find what's really going on and then it might be yep the application of whatever technique we're trying to work on. And in terms of your approach, is this something that you've developed through trial and error and figured out for yourself? Or have you had like an external influence or, you know, someone like, you know, maybe your coaches, so past like a mentor and past the, you know, this that style of training onto you or where does it come from? So this is when I was just really studying what, the elite level athletes are doing and you know they you often hear about uh you know ev everything that they do taking over their life and especially I've applied it and I've seen that it it works for me and then I observe it in kids and I just notice oh, like well why is he really well he's getting he's getting thrown because there's no there's no resistance and then it's like why is there no resistance it's like well he's already given up before he's even started so why is he doing that and so it was a bit of observation as well but I realized that those and seeing it as a pyramid for me it also helps because again what parents might see or what on the outside is what is happening is just the tip of the iceberg but then there's underlying things and I've noticed that in that order, um, I'm able to make out what what it is that the missing the missing piece is. So there's, it usually lies under those four four things. So the the technical component itself, the their physical ability, physical awareness on their own, their nutrition and let's say sleeping habits as well, or hydration, all of that, and then it's that mindset, which I think is you know that underlying base which we always can come back to and we we know how important that is but we don't see it in the sense of as a pyramid or at least that's what helps me I saw it as a as a pyramid and what's nice about that is that you can take that top of the 
the iceberg, the very top, and replace it with pretty much anything. It doesn't have to be jiu-jitsu, judo, eventually in life, even if they've got, they started out in, in this sport. That's that's what's beautiful about these martial arts is that tip of the iceberg can then be work, can be other things. But having that a solid foundation of mindset, physical awareness, and how you nourish your body health-wise, then really doesn't matter what you pick in life once you have that base. Yeah, it's relatively universal across any sport. I mean, obviously, there'd be some differences or any any sort of, you know, whether you just want to be the best person at work or to to be optimal. I think, you know, you've, they're the sort of main three frameworks and obviously they sort of change a little bit but no I think that's yeah fantastic points to make I mean you know I I saw it as like you know elite level athletes that's what they do that's what they focus on but then I was like oh, actually I think I'm pretty sure CEOs and the likes will do the same or emphasize how important it is for their um for them to produce optimally they need to have this routine, this these these things that are um, important for their well being, and then the whatever they choose, whatever their craft is, well, that's just what people see on the outside, the, the that iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, really good point. And what projects have you got coming up? What are you working on? competition wise or and obviously you mentioned you know looking through your black belt grading for your bjj but anything else on the horizon yeah yeah well um yes the jiu-jitsu jiu-jitsu black belts i think up there um i've i've uh as soon as i was i had completed the the judo showdown i was like oh i really you know i want to have the same feeling with with jiu-jitsu so I think into speaking from now until the end of the year, we've, I've got uh, Pan Pacifics in Jiu Jitsu. So I'm concentrating on that and, and being able to um, tick, tick that box as well for, for my grading. So that's something I'm, I'm working on now. At the moment, I'm getting more and more involved, I guess, with the Jiu Jitsu gym that I'm trainer but also manage so I do I do manage not just in terms of teaching but running the gym more and more involved and I'm yeah just seeing as well like I mentioned I'm from uh, Argentina and I've got friends as well as family members all over the world and I'm just seeing what opportunities I guess are uh, on the horizons as well overseas so it's a bit of a an unanswered question for myself as well, but we're we're exploring. I'm exploring what what else is out there, not just maybe in Australia, but abroad, just to get a bit more closer to my family as well. Yeah, it's nice that the world's opened up again. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it really is. No, fantastic. Really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come and talk and you know share your journey and uh, have a conversation. So, no, thank you, Romina. Yeah, no, it was it was great, great talk, talking to you, and I I think all of these topics are dear to to my heart. So anytime. Yeah, and you know, like same, you know, there's a reason why I asked you to come on here because I know we sort of in some ways share a similar opinion on a few of these things as so we had these conversations. So I appreciate it. Thank you. No worries. See you. Bye.